Hello, and welcome to episode 91 of ERRX, a podcast tailored to your clinical needs. I'm your host, Adis Carrick. This week, I wanted to do an episode revisit about the use of angiotensin II or Giapreza. I first talked about angiotensin II back in episodes 26 and 27, going over the ATHOS 3 trial, my own personal experiences with using it, and then I talked a little bit about some controversial aspects like thrombosis, infection rates, and its effects on patients with COVID. But since ATHOS 3 came out in 2017, there just hasn't been much else published about angiotensin 2, and there are no professional guidelines that discuss how and when to use it with most sites just coming up with their own protocols, typically using it as a third or maybe even a fourth line vasopressor in patients with refractory shock. And since we don't have much to go off of, I wanted to share what I found with you guys this week to hopefully help us all in our practices. As a little background, angiotensin II is an endogenous peptide and a component of the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone or RAS system. Renin is released when our kidneys sense hypotension, and it then cleaves angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 is then converted to angiotensin 2 by angiotensin converting enzyme or ACE. And this sounds familiar because ACE inhibitors are used to decrease blood pressure. Once angiotensin 2 is released, it binds to angiotensin 1 and angiotensin 2 receptors, and when it binds to the angiotensin 1 receptor, this causes vasoconstriction and an increase in blood pressure. In ATHOS 3 and other small trials, response to angiotensin 2 was evidenced by an increase in the MAP by about 10 mm mercury and the ability to wean off of other background vasopressors which happens in about 70% of all patients who get angiotensin II. The bummer is that it didn't improve mortality rates. It didn't even improve SOFA scores. So if all angiotensin does is fix our numbers and clear up our MAR, is it worth giving it to anyone? Or maybe there are certain subgroups of patients who could benefit more. In a review article from last year, the authors point out that angiotensin II could be an attractive option in patients who develop vasoplegic shock after cardiopulmonary bypass, which can occur in up to 20% of these patients. In a small subgroup analysis of the ATHOS-3 trial, which included 16 patients who underwent bypass, 8 of 9 patients who got randomized to angiotensin II achieved the primary endpoint of MAP increase, whereas none of the other 7 patients who got placebo did. And although this was a tiny sample size, it still was a statistically significant difference. They also mentioned that it could specifically be useful in patients with AKI. In another post hoc analysis of ATHOS 3, patients with AKI had significantly higher survival rates if they got randomized to angiotensin 2 versus placebo, at 53% versus 30%. Patients who received angiotensin II were also significantly more likely to be able to come off of renal replacement therapy by day 7 compared to the placebo group, at 38% versus 15%. There was also another super interesting and recently published multi-center review article looking at real-world use of angiotensin II. They, like us, wanted to try to figure out which patients respond to angiotensin II by comparing responders to non-responders. At the end, this review included 270 patients. Those who responded had similar baseline characteristics to those who didn't. And to get an idea of this patient population so that you can extrapolate it to your site, half of the patients had sepsis, about 40% were admitted after surgical procedures, and half of those were cardiovascular surgery patients. Their mean Apache 2 scores were 30, which was about the same as in Athos 3, and most had an average baseline lactate of 7.5. Angiotensin II was used mostly as the third or fourth line agent, started a median of 11 hours after the first vasopressor. So first off, just like in Athos 3 and my own personal experiences, about 70% of patients responded to angiotensin II, with an average MAP increase of 10 millimeters mercury. But here's where things got interesting. Patients already on vasopressin were six times more likely to respond once they got started on angiotensin II. And we still don't know why this is, but the authors think that the RAS and vasopressinergic systems act together to regulate fluid and blood pressure, or potentially that V1 receptors enhance the pressor effects of angiotensin II, 
Either way, this is a really cool finding that we should keep in mind. Also, they found that patients with lower lactate levels were significantly more likely to respond to angiotensin II, and by lower, they defined it as a median of 6.5 versus a median of a 9.5 lactate. Those two findings are important because response is linked to mortality. Patients who responded had significantly higher 30-day survival rates at 41% versus 25%. In another multi-center review of angiotensin II use in 162 patients, they found that patients on less than 0.2 to 0.3 mics per kilo per minute of norepinephrine equivalents prior to starting angiotensin II had significantly greater reductions of background vasopressors compared to patients receiving higher background doses. Also, they found that patients on less than or equal to 3 vasopressors had significantly greater reductions in the background vasopressor doses than those on more than three vasopressors. So maybe it's a good idea to start angiotensin II earlier in the course of therapy, before any treatment becomes essentially futile. To wrap up, we don't have much guidance on how to use angiotensin II or even who to give it to. And I just want to be clear, just getting angiotensin II doesn't increase survival rates. But if your patient has a hemodynamic response to it, then they have a higher chance of survival. So until we get more guidance, it seems best to use it in patients that have a higher chance of responding to it. So who are these patients? For now, this could be patients with vasoplegia after cardiopulmonary bypass, those with AKI or those on renal replacement therapy, or those with a lower baseline lactate level, so somewhere less than around 6 or 6.5. And given what we know now, it's probably a good idea to make sure your patient is on vasopressin before angiotensin II and to start angiotensin II earlier. I think that starting it as a third-line agent after norepi and vasopressin makes the most sense. And don't wait until your patient is already on super high doses of norepinephrine equivalents. For example, if a patient is on 0.1 mics per kilo per minute of norepi and a continuous infusion of vasopressin, they're already on 0.2 mics per kilo per minute of norepinephrine equivalents, and that may be an ideal time to start angiotensin II. None of this waiting until the patient is on one of norepi, continuous vasopressin, and an epi infusion for several hours, because by then, it could just be too late. The last point I want to touch on is which vasopressor to come off of first if your patient is started on angiotensin II. Some sites will turn off the vasopressin, Others will wean down the norepinephrine, and either way you do it, it doesn't lead to any strong mortality benefits, but we do know from some small retrospective trials that if you stop vasopressin first, it leads to more hypotension. So does what we know now about angiotensin II make me rethink this? I think so. If patients are on norepinephrine, vasopressin, and angiotensin II, and knowing that patients on vasopressin had better responses to angiotensin II, I think I'd try weaning the norepinephrine off first and then continuing to run vasopressin with the angiotensin II. As always, thank you so much for your time, and thank you for wanting to learn more about pharmacotherapy. If you have any comments or anything you'd like to add to this episode, please give me a shout-out on the ERRX Podcast Instagram page or reach out to me personally on errxpodcast.com. I'd love to respond to all comments and criticisms, especially those discussing how you use angiotensin II at your own site. Also, if you have a second, please follow and share the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, and just anywhere else you listen to podcasts. Following, sharing, and rating the show are great ways to help the podcast grow and get more of our community involved. <laughs>